Welcome, everyone. I'm Laura Ostenso, Knowledge Management Specialist here at AgriLinks. We are happy to have Harvest Plus with us today. And before I turn it over, turn it right over to Diane DeBernardo, the Nutrition Advisor with USAID's Bureau for Food Security, to get us kicked off. Good morning, everybody. Harvest Plus is a nonprofit agriculture research program coordinated by the International Food Policy Research in Institute and the Center, International Center for Tropical Agriculture. Harvest Plus is based in Washington, D.C. and has country offices in Africa, South Asia, and research partnerships throughout the world. Biofortification has progressed from the research to the delivery phase with USAID support. USAID has been an important partner since the organization's earliest years, and Harvest Plus today receives USAID funding for its vitamin A, orange sweet potato program in Uganda, and vitamin A maize in Zambia. Currently, 10 million people in rural households in Africa, Asia, and Latin America are growing and eating these and other biofortified foods. Harvest Plus goal is to scale up worldwide, working with a broad array of partners globally. Dr. Howarth Howdy Buis has been the director of Harvest Plus since its founding in 2003. He advocates widely for improving nutrition through food-based approaches and has worked with India, China, and Brazil to promote national biofortification programs. Dr. Buis holds a joint appointment at IFPRI in Washington, D.C. and at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture in Columbia. He received his BA in economics from Stanford University and his MA and PhD from Stanford's Food, Policy, Food Research Institute. He joined IFPRI in 1982 as a postdoctoral fellow in the Food Consumption and Nutrition Division, where he later held positions as a research fellow and senior research fellow. His research has focused on how economic factors affect food demand and nutrition outcomes, particularly in Asia. Dr. Anna Marie Ball is a native of Canada, but grew up in Zambia and has spent much of her career in Africa working on projects involving behavior change, demand creation, community health, agriculture, and nutrition. Dr. Ball received her PhD from the University of Manitoba in community health sciences, her master's in international rural development planning from the University of Guelph, and bachelor's of science in biology from Queen's University, Canada. She joined Harvest Plus in 2006 to lead the groundbreaking Research End Users Project, which piloted the delivery and evaluation of high vitamin A orange sweet potato in Uganda and Mozambique. This project, supported by USAID and other donors, demonstrated that farmers were willing to adopt orange sweet potato, and the additional vitamin A had clear nutritional benefits for women and children. Dr. Ball then served as manager of Harvest Plus Country Program in Uganda, and now leads Harvest Plus advocacy and partnership efforts throughout Africa. During today's presentation, she will discuss biofortification at the country level. Okay, thank you, Diane, and uh, we'd like we're very appreciative of USAID uh, hosting this webinar today, and thank you to the, everyone in the audience for taking the time to learn about biofortification to discuss biofortification. So let me, um, let me start with the evidence that we've generated. I, I think my message here today is that biofortification works. Uh, Harvest Plus got started in 2003. Uh, we're now 12 years into the program. In 2003, we didn't know biofortification would work, but now we have the evidence. Um, the, first, uh, the first issue that we needed to deal with was to breed high levels of minerals and vitamins into high-yielding backgrounds. Uh, we knew that farmers would not adopt crops that were lower yielding, that had lower profits, just because they were more nutritious. So one of the central tenets of the biofortification strategy of Harvest Plus is that our crops have to be just as high yielding, uh, just as profitable as, as other crops that farmers are growing. Then the, um, the value proposition that we offer to farmers is you get the same yields, but you also get the higher levels of minerals and vitamins, which I'll, I'll be discussing later. So we, um, in slides that I will show after this, um, we have now releases of high yielding crops in many countries around the world. So we've proven that we can breed uh, mineral and vitamin density into high yielding crops. 
That's the first very important piece of evidence that we've generated under Harvest Plus. The next issue is the nutritional efficacy. Once we've bred the minerals and vitamins into the crops, we have to show that when people who are deficient consume them, that uh, their, their mineral and vitamin status improves. So Harvest Plus has commissioned 14 efficacy trials for various crops around the world. And now most of that evidence is in. We've, uh, we've conducted um, for high iron, for iron deficiency, we've conducted studies for high iron beans, uh, for high iron pearl millet. Um, also, there was one with high iron rice where we've shown uh, improved iron status. And in fact, our principal investigators from Cornell University have now uh, done a meta-analysis of the various studies, which was presented at the Micronutrient Forum in Otis um, last June, showing uh, that the iron biofortified crops um, are efficacious. So we're, we're pretty much finished with the iron. The story is very similar for the vitamin A. We've had efficacy trials for orange sweet potato for many years that were published many years ago. Uh, recently, uh, we now have studies for high provitamin A maize, high provitamin A cassava that, uh, that are in the journals, and we have the evidence. There's still two more trials out in the field, and we haven't done a meta-analysis. For the high zinc crops, um, we've done bioavailability studies. The bioavailability is, is high, uh, but the efficacy trials are still in the field. We have three studies uh, that are ongoing in India with high zinc wheat, high zinc pearl millet, and a study will begin on the high zinc rice in Bangladesh later this year. So we have, we have a lot of evidence now on the nutritional efficacy of the biofortified crops. Then the, uh, the next piece of evidence um, is scaling up. We have to show that uh, farmers will adopt the crops um, and that people will eat them and that we have a public health impact. Uh, we've started on the delivery. We've been working on the delivery now for three or four years. Uh, we have a lot of positive evidence. We have a lot of um, uh, momentum for the scaling up. Uh, more than 2 million farm households have directly received the biofortified crops now, and I'll be discussing some of the evidence in later slides on the, on the scaling up. Um, we, know that, uh, we know that biofortification is cost effective. Uh, the, the main uh, power of biofortification is that we use agricultural research. You do the research in a central location. We develop the varieties. Those varieties are made available to agricultural research uh, institutions around the world. They're adapted to local growing conditions, and they're available in the food supply year after year after year. Most of your costs are in the original development, and then once they're in the food system, you don't have recurrent costs as you do with other types of interventions. That's the, that's the power of, of biofortification. So that's, uh, you know, that's a brief summary of the evidence that we've developed. Oh. So I wanted, to, I wanted to make a point that uh, USAID has been involved with us, with Harvest Plus, with biofortification from the start. Uh, we actually got our first grant to look into the feasibility of undertaking biofortification in 1993 from USAID. Uh, we were able, with that funding, we were able to identify a set of uh, plant breeders within the CGIR system who were interested in pursuing the strategy. Uh, it did take 10 years to develop a critical amount of funding so that we could start down the plant breeding uh, road, start developing the breeding pipelines. Uh, but we did that. We got that funding in 2003. USAID has been a, a significant supporter uh, during that time. And then we got our first releases in 2011-2012. Uh, and now the missions, the USAID missions in the countries where we're delivering the crops are supporting the delivery of biofortified crops. Our whole operation in Uganda uh, with uh, orange sweet potato and high iron beans is supported by the USAID mission. The USAID mission in Zambia is helping to support our dissemination of orange maize. 
and uh, and we're talking to other missions, and we hope we have some uh, other missions supporting us in the future. Uh, these are the uh, these are the target countries where Harvest Plus is focused on scaling up. So let me let me go through the countries a bit and the crops that we're working on. So in Africa, let's start in Africa. You can see that Uganda. We're working on the high pro vitamin A. Uh, sweet potato, and in addition, high iron beans. In Rwanda, we're focused on the dissemination of high iron beans. Let me let me emphasize that the that the beans in Rwanda are even higher yielding than the normal bean varieties that uh, uh, bean farmers are growing now in Rwanda. In Zambia, I've mentioned the high pro vitamin A maize. That's our our focus crop there. In DR Congo, we're working on two crops, high pro vitamin A cassava and high iron beans. And in Nigeria, we're focused on pro vitamin A cassava, but we've also released uh, orange maize, high pro vitamin A maize, and are starting a dissemination program on that as well. So those are our target countries in Africa. We haven't colored Ethiopia green. But we're, um, we're intending to open an office uh, in Ethiopia later this year or at the beginning of next year. And our initial crop that we'll be working on in Ethiopia is the orange maize, high pro vitamin A maize. Uh, moving over to South Asia, in India, we're working on high iron pearl millet. High iron pearl millet was released in 2012. Uh, high zinc wheat, the high zinc wheat is out in India and the high zinc rice will be released uh, next year in India. In Bangladesh, we have high zinc wheat. It was released two years ago. We're starting the dissemination program. And in Pakistan, we have uh, high zinc wheat, and th those uh, varieties will be released this year in Pakistan. So these are, these are our target countries. We have country managers. We have uh, dissemination strategies that we're implementing. We're raising funding uh, to work with collaborators to realize the scale up in those countries. Then all of the other countries uh, we, we consider as partnership countries and how we're going to get biofortified crops out in the partnership countries I'll, I'll be discussing uh, in subsequent slides. So this is a map of all the of all the countries where biofortified crops have been released or are being tested. So you can see that it's a global program. We now have biofortified crops released in 25 countries, and we're doing multi-location testing in 43 countries around the world. Uh, just um, on a on a somewhat technical note. Uh, to get a crop released in a country, we work with the National Agricultural Research Institutes. Uh, candidate varieties are uh, undergo, undergo multi-location testing, so we can pick varieties that uh, grow well in several different regions. Once those varieties are identified, they're submitted to varietal release committees that test the agronomic properties of the crops, uh, test that they meet certain minimum agronomic standards, and after usually two years of testing, uh, once it's proven that they meet these agronomic standards, then they're released and we're allowed to multiply the seeds and sell them to farmers. So we've gone through that process now in 25 countries with, with biofortified crops. And there are 43 countries where they're in multi-location testing. I want to I want to point out uh, three major countries where we want those countries with major scientific um, programs to get uh, working on their own biofortified programs. So I think the prime example is Brazil. The Embrapa, which has a huge uh, agricultural research system, has its own biofortification program that's supported by Embrapa. They're working on nine biofortified crops. I think they've released five different types of biofortified crops. And they're taking uh, regional leadership in Latin America. There's a Harvest Plus China program. I'll be in, uh, I'll be in Beijing at the end of June, beginning of July. Uh, there's a conference on leaking nutrition in agriculture that's uh, sponsored by the central Chinese government. 
They're going to be announcing that biofortification will be part of their next five-year plan, and they're deciding now what the program will be and what their investments will be in biofortification. Then the third major country that we want to take regional leadership is India. And uh, we're working uh, very closely with the Indian government on biofortification and have been working with them for the past 10 years. So this is, uh, again, this is a global program. Um, I'm an econ I'm trained as an economist, and uh, one of the reasons that I've that I've stayed uh, focused on biofortification, I've worked on it for 20 years now, is that it is so cost effective. Um, a group of um, economists called the Copenhagen Consensus, which includes five Nobel laureate winners in economics, they were asked to identify the 20 most productive investments that could be made in developing countries. And uh, about four years ago, they came out with a report. Um, they identified within the top five, they identified uh, uh, three interventions that focused on micronutrient malnutrition, uh, vitamin A supplements, um, iron fortification, and biofortification. Supplementation was the number one investment that could be made. Fortification was the number three most productive investment that could be made, and biofortification was the fifth most uh, productive investment that could be made. So biofortification's niche is that we start in the rural areas. We start with the smallholder farmers who grow part, uh, who eat part of what they grow. As, uh, as they produce surpluses of biofortified crops, they make their ways into the marketing system and they reach into urban areas. Fortification, fortified foods um, primarily start in urban areas where people are buying their foods. As the economies develop, the fortified foods make their ways into rural areas. So we feel that biofortification and uh, fortification are highly complementary strategies. We need every we need every type of intervention uh, that we can to fight this, this problem of mineral and vitamin deficiencies. Uh, biofortification is not a silver bullet, but it is a cost-effective approach uh, that we feel um, needs to be expanded in developing countries. Okay, there we go. Uh, well, I'll talk. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, a program uh, project that we implemented in Mozambique and Uganda to show that biofortification can be effective when it's implemented in a real-world situation. So we targeted 20,000, 24,000 households in Uganda and Mozambique. These were these were white sweet potato growing households. And we did extension with these 24,000 households and made the case with the mothers, uh, with the fathers, that if they would adopt and grow orange sweet potato, substituting one for one, the orange sweet potato for the white sweet potato, that they could protect their families from vitamin A deficiency. Well, we found that uh, about 75 or 80 percent of the households adopted the orange sweet potato. They didn't completely convert all of their land from orange to white. Maybe they converted about 50% of their land to the production of the orange sweet potato, and they consumed the orange sweet potato in their homes. This graph that's showing on the screen, the dark orange is the vitamin A intake on the, in the villages uh, where we did not intervene, where the households continued to grow just the white sweet potato. Those are the total vitamin A intakes. We had intervention villages. We had control villages. The dark orange was in the control villages. In the intervention villages where they converted part of their land, part of their sweet potato land to orange, vitamin A intakes were increased by the amount of the light orange bars on top of the dark orange bars. So they increased their vitamin A intakes by from 75% to 100%. And in Uganda, we took blood samples and we measured an improvement in the serum retinol of the children in the intervention villages as compared with the control villages. So this was our first evidence that in a real-world situation, 
that the introduction of biofortified crops could be effective in improving vitamin A status. So that uh, that include that concludes my brief summary of uh, of Harvest Plus of biofortification, the progress that we've made, and I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague Anna Marie Ball, um, who's been uh, very involved in the implementation on the ground uh, in Africa, and she'll talk about her experiences uh, there. Thanks, Howdy. Um, Hi to everybody that's listening. Um, Howdy's given a really great overview um, from, the, from the global perspective. And so what I'd like to do in the next uh, few minutes is just to talk to you a little bit about some of the lessons that we've learned from our country programs. And um, as you can imagine, with the, the number of years that we've been uh, delivering the crops, we've got, we've got quite a few observations. So this is by no means an exhaustive um, uh, comment on, on things that we've learned. And you will find that I will draw my examples uh, particularly about the orange sweet potato. I'm obviously uh, a great fan of the sweet potato, but also about the high iron beans. When Harvest Plus uh, in Uganda enters a community, the first person that arrives in is the agronomist. And his first message to the farmers is actually a nutrition message. So he would introduce the sweet potato as the vitamin A sweet potato and the beans as rich in iron and we need iron uh, to build strong blood. So as an agronomist, uh, he needs to talk about nutrition at a very basic level. Otherwise, why would a farmer even bother to plant a differently colored sweet potato, an orange one, when in fact they are used to white or cream colored ones. So we want to give the reason right from the beginning. So we're here with varieties that are, are better for your health than the ones that you're, you're currently growing. So the message that our partners um, receive is that what we're doing is nutrition through agriculture, but we will, in fact, um, address both the agriculture and the nutrition. As we, have, as we go into communities and we talk to, to farmers and we, we do a fair amount of research, um, we find that extension is considered to be uh, a preferred and trusted source of information for farmers. So, and, and this actually tends to be a primary source for many people if there are extension workers around. But from our experience, for, for, from my experience of, of 10 years working with the public and private extension services, my observation is that, in fact, um, while the extension workers can do the agronomy, they rarely talk about nutrition. So one of the things that we would do is to cross-train so that extension workers can speak about nutrition uh, at a basic level, that they know that the crops that they are bringing in are being brought in for the, for the uh, micronutrient that is, is present there. And that is bearing in mind, of course, that that we're not interested in sacrificing on yield. In fact, the, the varieties must match up in terms of yield uh, to, the, to the varieties that people are currently growing and um, have, have uh, disease and pest resistance as well. So the plus to the, to the varieties will be on the nutrition. And extension workers have to know this um, so that they can can give this information to the farmers that they're working with. The other question that we we talk about is who are we targeting when we are when we're working with farmers? Are we looking at women because they are um, feeding their families? Are we uh, 
targeting men because they're often seen to be the farmers. Um, and our experience is, of course, that it's better to uh, target households. So Sarah here uh, does feed her family, but she's also the family farmer. Julius is probably more interested in the agronomic messages and the marketing messages, but in fact, it's also in his best interest to get some of the nutrition messages. And the reason for that is obviously as someone who controls family resources, land and cash, um, he also needs to know that his children will be healthier with, with these crops and that obviously is going to affect his pocket because if he doesn't have to take his children to the clinic, he has, he's not putting out money for that, for that particular thing. So, so we want to provide agri the, the nutrition and the agro agronomic messages to both men and women in a household because it's the household that benefits. Now, particularly in Uganda, we do see that linking nutrition to grow good growth and performance in school is actually really a, a poignant message because education is so highly valued that when you are able to um, to make that linkage for people they can actually they do get it now another one of our interests in harvest plus is how do we get uh, the biofortified crops out in the most cost-effective way and um, we currently have some some interesting research going on in Uganda that looks at the diffusion um, from farmer to farmer um, how do how do farmers do it who do they who do they share with and the question that that we're asking is how how much saturation in a community do you need to have for the biofortified crops to be anchored so that if there was a, a drought, if there was a flood, would you know would there be enough seed within the communities to to for it to be rooted there, anchored there? Now, both in in Uganda and Mozambique, we've um, played around a little bit with the idea of payback or pay forward, where farmers are encouraged, actively encouraged, to share seed. Now, of course, with the vegetatively propagated crops such, such as the sweet potato and also with cassava, this works very well because um, the, seed, the, the seed is kept in your garden and you can easily, easily share. Also with beans, um, because they're not hybrid, um, they are also easily shared. So in this slide, what you see is Martha, who is a lead farmer in her um, in her farmers group, she's working with the farmers. They've they've pooled their their seed together, with the intention that they will actually share with um, another farmers group. But we know, and we are tracking, in fact, um, farmers who share their seed with um, relatives and friends, and um, calculating up how how cost effective this is in actually anchoring uh, the seed within within communities. Those of you that uh, that work in agriculture know that quite possibly the first question that a farmer will ask you uh, when you bring in a new variety is can I sell this? And we are convinced, of course, that um, addressing markets is key to long-term sustainability. Uh, crops may stay in a family garden uh, for the nutrition, but we know that crops will stay in a garden, um, be maintained there if a farmer can sell the crops. And so we like to engage markets from the beginning. Um, recently, we had some some radio work um, uh, surveys going out asking farmers, "Do you think the the farmers should sell their crop or just keep it at home?" And 
it won't surprise any of you that farmers say at least the person should sell some of their crop because that will allow them to deal with some of the issues in their household. But they don't want the farmers, they don't encourage their fellow farmers to sell everything. So that's for for those of us working in biofortification and with these crops, where you want to make uh, an impact on family health, that's actually a really good thing. So people are consuming the crops, but they're also taking the opportunity to sell. In all of our countries that we're working in, in Africa, we have engaged the mass media to create demand. And that ranges from a radio mini-drama in, in Uganda with 30 episodes of uh, a story of intrigue about a lady who has the orange sweet potato and a husband that wants to sell off her land and children that need some, some good nutrition. And how does she manage? We've also... Uh, worked with uh, Nollywood to produce some films about the yellow cassava, pro-vitamin A cassava. And in, and in Rwanda, we've engaged uh, popular singers who have uh, put out a music video. You can go to YouTube and uh, listen to it when you're offline. And um, then they, the singers went around the country doing road shows. And this creates tremendous demand for, for the crops, and it's a great thing. The caveat to this is if you do not have your seed system in place, if you don't have the source of seed sorted out before you create this demand, you will find yourself in hot water because people are very enthusiastic. I am constantly amazed by how farmers are so willing to try a new variety. So if you create the demand... Make sure that you have the, the seed system in place. You've got the seed there. You can direct the farmers to where they can find the seed because they are going to want to try it, and that's exactly what you want. So some preparation is definitely needed. The, other, the last point that I'll make, and then I'll hand it over to Howdy, is to say that farmers never, ever um, produce and consume within a vacuum, they political vac vacuum. They need the support of policymakers who know and understand the issues. And uh, so, in each country, they uh, the country teams have engaged with policymakers to make sure that biofortification is on the agenda, on the national agenda, worked into the plans uh, for agriculture, nutrition, uh, for education. And what we are seeing right now, uh, a good example is that the government of Uganda is, is actually taking up the biofortified crops in a World Bank project that will involve uh, health, new, health, agriculture, and um, education. And they'll introduce uh, at least two of the biofortified crops. Okay, now I'll... Um I'll finish up by by talking about uh, where we're headed next with Harvest Plus. Um, just continuing on this slide that we're on now, the um, the Minister of Agriculture of Bangladesh uh, endorsed biofortification at the International Conference, Second International Conference on Nutrition, uh, which was held at FAO last year. The other three slides are from our uh, second global conference on biofortification, which Harvest Plus sponsored about a year ago uh, in Kigali. Um, that's up in the upper right is Akinadesina, the Minister of Agriculture of, of Nigeria, who was uh, endorsed biofortification. The lower left hand is the Minister of Health uh, from Rwanda, who also uh, was endorsing biofortification. And in the lower right-hand corner is Rachel Kite, uh, Vice President at the World Bank, whose comment at the conference was, um, now we've, we've kind of switched. Before, people were asking, should we do biofortification? Is it the right thing to do? Now, with the evidence that we have, the question now for policymakers is, if you're not implementing biofortification, why aren't you implementing biofortification? 
So what's the uh, what's the road ahead? I, I I pointed out our eight target countries, nine target countries as we add Ethiopia, but there's so many other countries uh, where we want to start the implementation of biofortification. So there are so many different types of institutions that we want uh, them to embrace biofortification and mainstream the use of biofortified crops within their day-to-day -day, uh, activities. So the, the primary actor that we want to get engaged are our private sector entities. So with the, uh, with, especially with the hybrid crops, the mazes are hybrids, uh, the pearl millet in India is hybrids. We want seed companies to develop their own biofortified varieties um, and to be involved in the, in the marketing of biofortified seed. We've done that with um, the Nirmal Seed Company in India with the pearl millet. Other companies are now getting involved. Uh, we've done that with three uh, seed companies in Zambia with the Orange Maze, uh, the three major actors. The, those three companies in Zambia next year uh, will be producing Orange Maize biofortified seed, which will constitute 5% of the commercial market in Zambia. So we're making um, uh, very good inroads there uh, with private seed companies. At the same time, the public uh, agricultural research communities need to mainstream biofortification. We can't, we can't have some one stream of high-yielding crops coming out that are drought-resistant, climate-smart, and another stream of, uh, uh, that are biofortified crops that don't have these agronomic properties. We have to combine the two. The climate-smart crops have to also be biofortified, so we have to get the public agricultural research institutes to mainstream biofortification, and we're working very hard on that, first within our centers, the CGIR centers, and then also with an agri national agricultural research institutes. Uh, in addition, uh, we're working with international NGOs. We've, uh, we've signed an MOU with World Vision. They have agricultural programs in 90 countries around the world. They want to integrate their agricultural programs with their health programs, and they see biofortified crops as a, as a perfect way to do that. So we're working with them in, in countries where we're releasing crops, but we don't have programs. We're working with World Vision to develop the funding, to develop the technical, technical expertise so that World Vision can take the lead in introducing biofortified crops in those countries, which we call partnership countries. Uh, multilateral institutions, the World Food Program has a purchase for progress where they're helping uh, program where they're helping farmers uh, develop their productivity and then they buy their produce and store, they buy locally and store in World Food Program warehouses. Well, it's a simple step to substitute a biofortified crop for the regular crop. So in Rwanda, they're substituting high iron beans for regular beans in the purchase for a progress program, and they've now purchased 77 tons of biofortified high iron beans to store in their warehouses. Uh, the World Bank has uh, recently announced uh, a grant to the Ugandan government. It's a $27 million grant, and one of the key components is the dissemination, the scaling up of orange sweet potato and high iron beans. Uh, these, are, these are exactly the types of programs that we want the NGOs and multilateral programs to become engaged in. We want to spin this off to these institutions. Uh, we've just talked in the previous slide about the advocacy and the support by national governments and regional organizations. Um, you know, we're engaged uh, with CADAP in, uh, in Africa. I was just at, uh, Anna Marie and I were just at the African Union uh, two weeks ago, and uh, a press release came out by the Commissioner for Rural Economy and Agriculture endorsing the biofortification strategy. Uh, we need to create consumer demand. That's the ultimate sustainability of biofortification if consumers demand the biofortified crops. Anna Marie talked about our, our using uh, the media. Um, the private sector marketing, we're, we're talking to food processing companies, uh, millers, um, 
to use biofortified crops. We're developing new products uh, that involve the use of biofortified crops that are processed. This creates, uh, this creates demand. The farmers are able to sell the biofortified crops in the markets. This is something that the, that the farmers want to do. They, they need to sell part of what they produce. And then, of course, we're, we're generating evidence um, across the world um, uh, documenting what the reach of biofortified crops is, what the public health benefit is, uh, what works in the dissemination of crops, uh, what doesn't work, what's most cost effective. And then Harvest Plus is collecting this evidence um, and then sharing it uh, with others so that they can implement the biofortification strategy. So, um, in a nutshell, that's what uh, that's what Harvest Plus is working on. Looking forward, uh, the road ahead for Harvest Plus. So that uh, that ends our formal remarks, and uh, we're very happy to take questions now. and And thank you again for taking the time uh, to participate in this session with us. Great, thank you so much. Sounds like a lot has been done, and a lot more is is in the pipeline to happen. It's really exciting and we have a broad array of participants right now in the we webinar who have been asking quite a few questions throughout. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with with some of the more as I like to think sciencey questions, but okay. really what is the progress on amino acid fortified varieties in crops? Yeah, the the first biofortification uh, program in our system actually started back in the 1970s. Uh, the, the name of the program was what they called quality protein maize, uh, high lysine maize. QPM is the, is the acronym. Back in the 1970s, um, the nutrition community identified protein as a public health problem. Quality protein is a public health problem. They identified a maize that was high in lysine, but it was low yielding, uh, and it had terrible consumer characteristics. But a breeding program was started at our center in Mexico, the International Center for Maize and Wheat Improvement. They started developing QPMs. Um, they had difficulty getting, high, getting the high lysine and high yielding backgrounds. Um, but over a number of years, they, they did manage to get them into, into high-yielding backgrounds. A problem is that there was a, basically a short time frame during which the, the international uh, nutrition community identified protein. They, they basically came out and said, in the late 1970s, we made a mistake. It's not a limiting public health problem. But the uh, but the breeding program continued, um, and there are there are varieties that are available that are high yielding. But let me let me contrast the difference between what Harvest Plus is doing and what happened with the quality protein maize program. I don't want to I don't want to put down the quality protein maize, but we started from the beginning. We knew that the nutrition community identified vitamin A, iron, and zinc, as well as iodine as as major public health problems. We started with that. We quickly determined that we could not address the iodine problem through plant breeding, but we could vitamin A, iron, and zinc. Iodine is, is well addressed through salt fortification. Then we, as I've already emphasized, we bred them in high yielding backgrounds. There wasn't, uh, it wasn't nearly as difficult to breed high minerals and vitamins in high yielding backgrounds as it was the quality protein maize. Then we did the efficacy trials. It was very important for us to generate the evidence on the efficacy trials and give that evidence, show that evidence to the nutrition community so that they would support the biofortification strategy. To the best of my knowledge, I don't believe that there have been efficacy trials uh, done in human subjects that have been published in uh, major human nutrition journals. Um, and now, with the, with the dissemination of the biofortified crops, the vitamin A, the iron, and the zinc, we are raising the resources, developing the strategies to have programs in our target countries to get those varieties out. 
there are small amounts of funding and there is interested in the uh, in getting the QPMs out but I don't think there's uh, there's ma there's a major program and major backing for the dissemination of those crops so we do as we travel around the African countries I just spent um, I just visited five African countries on a on a two-week trip in each country that we went to we were asked about QPMs and I and I told and I tell that story and um, you know there it's just it's not part of harvest plus it may be a it may be a very good intervention um, you know we wish we wish QPMs well but that's um, that's the status of the QPMs maybe I went on longer than I should have <laughs> Um, in terms of Harvest Plus initiatives, can you expand a little bit in terms of um, iodine? Yeah, yeah, there, we, we're not working on iodine. Um, basically, the amount of iodine that gets into crops uh, is totally dependent on the amount of iodine in soils. And so it's not genetically controlled. It's not something that you can breed for. So we don't work on iodine in the biofortification strategy. Mm -hmm. Good thing to keep in mind for the International Year of Soils, how these two things can, can connect. Yeah. There, I, I'll mention a very interesting uh, study that was done in China. Mm. Uh, there was an area that this link, this is how agriculture and nutrition can be linked. There was, a, there was an area in China where iodine deficiency in humans was a very big problem. And there was a professor from Duke University, whose name I don't remember now. He, he ran an experiment. He dripped iodine in the irrigation water. The iodine, uh, through the irrigation water, the iodine got in the soil. It got into the crops. And it solved the iodine deficiency problem in the villages where they dripped the iodine. Now, what was very, what was very interesting was salt iodization is obviously an alternative um, for addressing the problem, but it turns out the animals were also iodine deficient because iodine was uh, deficient in the soil. So they actually dripping it in the irrigation system actually improved the animal productivity as well, solved the iodine deficiency problem in the animals. So it's just an example. If you take a more of a holistic approach, you look at how to solve these problems through the agricultural system. Sometimes you can come up with uh, very efficient approaches to solving the problem. It's an amazing example. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of j jaws dropping. <laughs> Mine was. Um, what about while we're on this? What about selenium or calcium while we're kind of on this yeah. topic? Uh, selenium. Um, the the government of Finland had a selenium deficiency problem. Uh, they decided to try to address it by putting selenium in fertilizers, mandating that all fertilizers um, have selenium in them, a trace mineral, and it worked. Uh, it got into the soil, it got into the, into the food system, and selenium deficiency in, in Finland was solved. They found that their initial, um, the initial amounts that they put into the fertilizers were too high, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they cut back on the amount that was put in the, in the fertilizers, but it, it, eventually it was a very effective way of, of treating the problem. So again, selenium is something that, that uh, the problem can be addressed through adding uh, that element to, the, to fertilizers, getting it into the soil, getting it into the food system. And it's not something that we're working on in Harvest Plus or with biofortification. Mm -hmm. Another question that has come up is in terms of, you know, when you're working with the biofortification is how, how do you ensure that it's absorbed in the body later. So how how do we know that these nutrients and, and kind of make sure for for yeah. that that yeah. it is absorbed? Yeah. The um, yeah bioavailability was a huge issue when we discussed biofortification in the 1990s. Uh, there was a, a, a significant debate in the nutrition community about the percent of the trace minerals that would be absorbed when the biofortified crops were consumed. Uh, staple foods have phytates. Uh, phytates are known to bind the, uh, the iron and the zinc. 
And um, some, some nutritionists argued that the bioavailability would be such a low percentage that it w wouldn't make much difference at the levels that we could breed into the crops. Other nutritionists argued that people who were deficient would absorb the minerals at a higher rate because they were deficient. The body regulates. If you're deficient, you're more efficient at absorbing what's in the diet. If you're, if you're replete in the nutrient, you absorb a lower percentage. Well, we've done the trials now. We've done the efficacy trials. And we've proven that the, the latter group was correct, that uh, people who are deficient absorb the minerals at a high rate and were able to improve their iron status. We're still doing the zinc efficacy trials, but we've shown that the bioavailability is sufficiently high. In the vitamin A crops, we actually found that the efficiency of conversion of the pro-vitamin A to retinol was actually much better in food staples than it is from vegetables and fruits. They usually assume a conversion rate of 12 to 1 of pro-vitamin A to retinol in vegetables and fruits. We have found in the pro-vitamin A cassava and the pro-vitamin A maize, we found conversion rates of 6 to 1 rather than 12 to 1, and even better than 6 to 1 in some examples. <laughs> So, so far, the, the questions have really focused on the nutritional aspects and, and different pieces of that. Let, let's move a little bit into adoption. Different people are asking, you know, how, did, how have you promoted adoption? And you did speak earlier about this. Um, a specific question is, how does the color of the maize in Zambia impact the uptake of the product, especially given that the traditional color of this maize is white? Okay, I'll let Anna-Marie do some of the talking. <laughs> That's actually a great question. That's a, the kind of question that we also faced in Uganda with the sweet potato is, will people in fact uh, be willing to to take up a crop that, that looks different than um, than the one that they are, they are used to, which is white? Um, Surprisingly, I, th I think um, this is, is less of an issue than we had expected, although it is something that has to be addressed. Um, one of the things that, that we find is that you do have to tell people why there's a different color here and that mm -hmm. um, this is about a crop that has vitamin A in it. And... Because of the fairly high levels of um, knowledge about vitamin A that mothers have, because they're told to bring their children to the clinics for immunization and vitamin A supplementation, they actually know that vitamin A is important for their children. And so they get that message. But um, for those of you that have worked in the maize sector and in southern Africa, even East Africa, you will know that there is a, a history of yellow maize that has come into some of the countries as relief food and that there are very strong, and I might say negative, emotions uh, associated with yellow maize. So for sure this is something that uh, we've been extremely conscious of. Um, when I was introduced, I was uh, you were told that I grew up in Zambia, and I did, and I was there when the yellow maize was there, and I ate it. But... Um, so you can't you can't tell people that this is you know this is a silly a silly issue they take it really seriously and it's one of the reasons that we we like to show the pictures uh, where you've got a white maize cob a yellow one and an orange one because there really is a difference here um and people when they see that that's that's an interesting thing for them it's also interesting for them that the maize is grown in zambia it is not brought from from outside but for those people who are not growing and consuming their own crops so really the urban population um they're buying the mealy meal in the shops and so what they see is a um, is a maize meal that is lighter in color so not as orange and that's why we really are very convinced that you have to have that vitamin a message uh, attached to to the packaging so that people can understand the reason behind 
um, having having the the color change. And I think that when we've done taste tests in the field, um, what people will say is um, that they like the taste of the orange maize better than the white maize. Now, we'd like to be really clever and, and say that we intended that, but actually that's an unintended benefit, and we're going to ride it all the way. Um, we've we've had some nice stories of of people saying well i i cannot eat that colored that colored in shima using the orange maize and when they taste it they say oh that's that's really nice so for some people the color will be an issue but i think that as people get the message about the vitamin a and and as they taste it uh i think that's those are more compelling reasons to adopt And given Harvest Plus experience, what has been the most effective way to get that message out? What has been your lesson learned in terms of increasing uptake of these biofortified foods? Well, you know, I think it depends on at what stage you are at in mm. disseminating your crops. At the beginning, uh, we had to make sure that we were using a person-to-person -person type of communication mm -hmm. so that there was a credibility um, that built up. So again, I, I refer to extension workers as trusted and preferred sources of information um, and an interactive source of information. So when people had their questions, they could put their questions to a person. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as the crop um, is seen in the country, becomes um, is seen in, in different areas of the country, I think that um, using mass media uh, is, is very effective. Um, many of the countries that we're working in have very good coverage in their mass media. And so with careful messaging, um, you can you can get the word out to a lot of people. Um, I noticed that one of our participants on the on the webinar is actually one of our former extension workers, yeah. um, and uh, I'm sure he would put in a few comments there. And he was right there at the beginning, uh, where it was very much um, word of mouth. Here's the demonstration. Here's how we go. And I think he would be pleasantly surprised to hear the mass media that's <laughs> happening in, in Uganda and uh, how many of the urban dwellers now now actually do know about the uh, these crops. I'll, I'll add uh, just a, a bit. Uh, this picture that I, that I put up from the slide uh, we took in uh, Lusaka just two weeks ago. This is uh, the orange maize meal being sold in pick-and-pay supermarkets. Uh, that, that isn't our, our people who buy uh, in supermarkets aren't our target audience, but it shows the Star Milling Company has found that there is a demand uh, for the orange maize now. Uh, we visited their mill and their delivery trucks have their products on the side of the truck, so they had their white maize, but the central one was the orange maize. It was just exactly this package on the side of the trucks. And uh, two, uh, we, we saw uh, two commercials that are being prepared to air on TV uh, that I thought were quite good. Uh, they still need some editing, but when the harvest comes in in June and there's a, there's a much larger supply for the millers, uh, those, those advertisements will go on TV. The other, the other point I'll make is that this is for the vitamin A crops. Uh, so you, people are used to eating white sweet potato, white maize, white cassava. So with the pro-vitamin A, we change the color. So we have to provide uh, this information to get people to switch. And we, when we do provide the information, we, we do find that people are willing to switch. It's how can we get the cost down. Mm. But with the iron and the zinc, those are invisible. So you need a different strategy with the invisible nutrients. So the best strategy for those is to just piggyback on the best agronomic properties. So, for example, our high iron beans in Rwanda yield, um, I'm told, a ton and a half, whereas normal beans yield a ton. 
We've released 10 high iron bean varieties with these superior agronomic qualities. So I think that those bean varieties will take over a very high percentage of the total supply. So you don't really, uh, anybody goes to the market at that point, any bean that you buy in the market is a high iron bean. Farmers adopt the varieties because they're high yielding, they're more profitable. To me, it's, a, it's like a strategy of putting fluoride in the water system. Uh, we all know that there's fluoride in the water, but we don't think about it. We just, uh, you know, we just consume it. So it's that, it's got that kind of strategy with the high iron, high zinc varieties. That's really interesting, hearing about the visible versus the invisible um, in terms of adoption and getting information out that promotes adoption. Um, so you mentioned person-to-person -person extension and also mass media. Um, a, a couple of questions came in specifically about extension, so that one-to-one -one, uh, promotion. In the countries where you're working so far, how have you found the numbers or the ratios in terms of direct contact with extension workers? And how do you interact with extension offices uh, depending on those numbers? So depending on the country that we're working in, um, we may engage with um, both the public extension system and the private extension. Um, usually both, actually. <laughs> uh, because because you, yeah, you, you, don't, you do not want to ignore the, um, the public system, even if, it's, even if it's not working to its full capacity. It is a system in place. And when you're looking to um, ensure that the whole country gets access to the biofortified crops, you want to use all channels possible. So um, I know that actually in all of the countries that we're working in in Africa, um, there's, a, there's a, a good interaction with the public system uh, using um, whoever is on the ground and, and the, their general ways of, of working with, um, with their farmers. So I can't really say what the ratio would be um, because I think that uh, differs from country to country. Uh, in the countries where we have research going on, and so I can refer to, to Uganda, um, from area to area, we would be looking at standardizing the ratio of um, extension workers to, to farmer groups and to farmers so that we, when we're doing the research, it's a comparable, um, a comparable ratio. Um, and in that case, what we're looking at is ensuring that the extension worker is not so stretched that he or she may not be able to get to the, um, the farmers groups on a regular basis. But the, probably the less satisfying answer to that is that it, it does vary from country to country. Great. I, yep. I'll, I'll just add that um, it it varies a lot from the from the the root crops to the to the grains that can be multiplied quickly. Um, sweet potato vines, uh, once they're once they're cut, they have to be replanted within two or three or four days, or they go bad. Uh, cassava stalks don't multiply quickly. Uh, you cut them, and I think they have to be planted within 10, 10 to 14 days. So the private sector is not interested in um, developing, uh, working in private seed markets. So in those kinds of instances, you work with the NGOs, you work with their farmer networks, um, and, uh, you know, you make the vines, you make the stocks available. It's a relatively expensive approach uh, as compared with, say, the, the hybrid mazes that are now being marketed by the seed companies in Zambia. Um, but, it, but in the end, what you want is for the farmers who adopt that you reach directly with the extension system is for them, if they like the crop and they like the technology, well, then they give vines to their neighbors. They give vines to their relatives. And it starts diffusing through farmer-to-farmer -farmer dissemination mm -hmm. if it's something that's, that's popular. And then once you reach a, a sort of a critical mass, it starts to sell itself. 
So that's that's what we you, you have to start somewhere, and it's a, it's you when you first start, it's kind of expensive to get it out to the first farmers. Mm-hmm. But if it's something that's really a, a good deal for the farmer, something that the farmers like, it starts expanding. And then, you know, once you hit 25% of the market, if people are saying, oh, what are you growing? What's that? Right. And, it, and it just passes by word of mouth. And so then it, then it becomes very efficient. It, it sort of disseminates on itself. That's the beauty of seeds. They, <laughs> they multiply themselves. I like that. I think we, we can quote that. Uh, really nicely uh, in terms of seed systems and there was actually a question earlier from one of the participants in in terms of seed systems how have these um, uh, been how has a kind of the framework or national piece of seed systems been either a a barrier or a non-barrier well I I yeah, it's been. I'd say it varies by crop. It's um, it's been it's been a barrier, as I've said, for the for the vines, for the sweet potato, for the cassava. Um, we figured out ways of uh, improving the multiplication rates, for example, of the cassava, so that we've lowered the costs. Um, at the other end of the spectrum are the are the hybrids, uh, hybrid maize varieties, the hybrid pearl millet varieties that are just it's it's really in the hands of the seed companies now in terms of of marketing their seed to their to their regular customers uh, and re- reaching that critical mass that I that I talked about previously. Um, one of but one of my favorite examples on that is an innovation in the orange sweet potato. So normally the farmers pass the vines on from neighbor to neighbor. The, the, the markets for vines are not well developed. But um, Harvest Plus has figured out a way through tissue culture mm-hmm. to produce vines that are, that are virus free. And we find that when those uh, vines are planted, we can uh, as much as double yields. So these these vines, it's almost like a hybrid seed. These vines are much more valuable than the normal vines because they're virus free and they increase production. So we've so the way the the um, the, the plants get the viruses is through the the white the white fly that that flies from plant to plant. So uh, screen houses, a system of screen houses has been developed where the, where the vines are initially virus-free. They're transferred to other uh, areas that have the, the nets and the flies are kept off to finally where you have a big enough supply where farmers can come and buy the vines. And they have to, but they have to pay more for the vines because they're more valuable. So we've created a, a seed system, a private sector seed system for the vines. Farmers pay, have to pay a little bit more for the vines, but then they realize when they double yields, hey, it's worth it. And so there's a huge demand for these virus-free vines. So we're starting, actually starting to create a private market for the vines where no private market has uh, existed before. Wow, and someone asks, um, do these improved varieties, either in seeds or, for example, you're speaking about the vine, do they require an annual purchase, uh, or can they save them for the next season? If if the I, I gave the example of the hybrid varieties, the maize and the pearl millet, hybrid varieties need to be purchased each year. The seeds are more expensive, but again, the yields are higher and, and more than pay for the, um, the expense of the seeds. This is why um, maybe I think 80% of maize production in Zambia is now hybrids. A similar percentage of pearl millets in India are hybrid, hybrid seeds. Mm. The beans, no, you replant the beans um, from, your, from your production. Um, but the quality of the seed goes down year after year, and it it is worthwhile mm-hmm. to replace your seed after after a couple of years because your yields uh, your yields go back up. Again, the the vines, the sweet potato vines, once they get infected with a virus, you can replant them, but your yields keep declining. So it really pays to go get the virus free vines so that you can maintain your production at higher levels. Right. So let me just also add that um, when Howdy talks about virus in 
sweet potato. It's not just the orange sweet potato. Yeah. It's all sweet potato. It's mm. all beans. It's all ma maize. It's that's that's a common issue. So it's not specific yeah. to the biofortified crops. Good point. Great. We we have a couple questions here in terms of climate smart crops and hoping just to get some more information and insight in terms of um, how climate smart crops are bred with biofortified crops. Okay, I'll um, I'll give the I'll give the example again of beans uh, that were where the basic. Um, Development of the varieties, the biofortified varieties, has been done at CIOT, our, our center in Columbia. Uh, Steve Beebe has been the head of the bean breeding program at least since 1994. He came to our first conference in 1994 and has been uh, breeding high iron beans. Um, and there was, um, I bring his name up because about, I think it was three months ago, uh, there was uh, uh, some articles on the internet about the heat beater beans that Steve Beebe has developed at SEAT. So beans in general are not very tolerant to high temperatures, so beans tend to be grown at higher elevations, so the country of Rwanda is a high elevation country where the temperatures don't get that high, but um, SEAT has been working all along on developing heat tolerant varieties. We all know that with climate change the temperature is rising, so the area in which beans can grow is shrinking, but because the heat tolerance, they've developed heat tolerant beans, the actual um, mm -hmm. area can now expand because of this breeding. So at the same time that that Steve's breeding program for heat tolerant beans, he's doing that at the same time he's combining that with high iron yeah. so that we have heat tolerant high iron beans. And that's exactly what we're trying to do is piggyback on what all the agricultural research institutes are doing to develop varieties that are drought tolerant, that are heat tolerant, that are climate smart. At the same time you can combine high minerals and vitamins in those, in those same varieties. So it becomes mainstream. Breeding for minerals and vitamins is a mainstream trait within the agricultural research institutes. And what are some insights regarding how we can sustain breeding-based biofortification in the soil if the soil is not fertile for the micronutrients in question? Yeah. So this, um, the question often comes up, aren't we depleting the soils of zinc and iron mm -hmm. over time? We're mm -hmm. loading more into the seed, so eventually, or, and, and we all know about uh, zinc deficient soils and iron deficient soils. So this is a, this is a basic lesson that I learned from uh, Ross Welch, who was a USDA scientist who I met back in 1993, who convinced me that this was a, a workable solution. He said that um, these are trace minerals. There's there are enough trace tra there's enough zinc, there's enough iron in all soils to support this strategy. It's actually a very low percentage of the the amount of zinc and iron that's transferred to the seeds is a very very low percentage of what's actually in the soil uh, so you're not it isn't it isn't like nitrogen and phosphorus where you can deplete the soils uh, in, with just a few crops and you have to add it back through fertilizers um, there are soils that are called zinc deficient, iron deficient, but it's not because there isn't physically a lot of iron and zinc in the soils. It's because the pH in the soils, the chemical properties of the soils are such that the iron and zinc is bound in the soils and not available to some genotypes of the same crop. But some genotypes can exude substances from the roots, change the chemistry of the soil around the roots, and make the zinc and the iron available to the plant. And then that can be translocated into the seed if you have the right, the right genes in the crop that you've, that you've put in through the breeding process. So, we're, so we're, um, all, all soils have enough iron and zinc to support the strategy. So veering again to adoption, we have a question about how do you know the varieties are reaching those who are nutrient deprived, especially with hybrid seeds 
which tend to be purchased by quote unquote better off farmers. So how, how do we know we're really reaching the most rural communities? Um, well, the initially, um, yeah, we, we face we face a dilemma as we initially roll out the crops. Um, I, I showed this slide where we had the maize on the supermarket shelves in the pick and pay in, mm -hmm. in Zambia, and I said that wasn't our target audience. Right. We have to, our vision is that eventually most of the maize in Zambia will be orange maize. But we have to create the demand, we have to make sure that the biofortified crops are marketed. Um, we could we could pursue a strategy where we just target the the poorest, most vitamin A deficient farmers in Zambia and just focus on those and forget about the marketing system. But that that would be a very slow way for us to achieve our vision that that uh, you know that all maize in Zambia will be orange maize. Um, so we don't. We don't ignore there are a lot of there are a lot of smallholder farmers that buy hybrid maize. Uh, we are developing open pollinated varieties that will be made available to the to the poor farmers. Um, we, it's just that the breeding process has gone faster with the hybrid maize. It's out now. Uh, we're using that to help develop the marketing system. Mm -hmm. But eventually there will be open pollinated varieties. We'll have to work with the NGOs, with their farmer networks. It will be more expensive. It won't be through the private sector, uh, but we'll reach them. And, and eventually everybody will have access to the orange maize. So that's, that's one example. Great. And you just mentioned, um, as you did earlier, the role of the the private sector. We have a question specifically about input suppliers and um, what role you see for them in delivering extension. Well, the, I guess the main input is the seed. Is the is the seed? I've talked a lot about the seed system. Um, the other, I suppose, the other main uh, suppliers would be the the fertilizer dealers. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The um, the basic tenant of the of the strategy is that we're we're trying to be um, the least invasive as possible. We're not we're not uh, seeking a major change in behavior. If uh, if a farmer is growing a non biofortified variety and they're using fertilizer and they're using irrigation or they're or they're organic or they're not organic or they're not using fertilizer and not irrigation. Whatever their current practice is, we just want them to substitute one for one the biofortified variety for the non-biofortified variety. Um, it will be our our promise is that it will be just as high yielding, and in the best of circumstances, it will be even higher yielding given the same inputs that they're currently using. We're not uh, we're not asking farmers to change their practices in terms of their input use. No, just keep just keep the the same practices that you have. Um, if there if there is an opportunity to do some extension, if there is some uh, best practices in terms of agronomics, and we can work those inexpensively into the extension program, we'll teach them. The better practice, along with introducing the biofortified variety, but it's not a it's not a necessary element to our strategy. Right. It sounds like really meeting meeting farmers and input suppliers and yeah. each actor where they are yeah. um, versus kind of pushing them into a specific space. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, uh, it was interesting. I. I was invited by the ethics department at Purdue University to give a to give a presentation on the strategy, and I was really surprised that an ethics department would would invite me to give a strategy. So I asked him. I asked him what attracted you about the strategy. He said, he said because you're so non-invasive, it's a it's a very simple thing to switch in a biofortified variety for a night. You're not asking them to change their life, their behavior, etc. It's just uh, it's just a simple cost-effective technology, and we thought that was very ethical. 
So um, it turned out he had no idea that the that the basic science for the orange maze was also done at Purdue University. Oh. So we got the we get, so I I introduced the ethics department to the people in the agricultural department. And we had a nice seminar between agriculture and and ethics at Purdue. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so you've talked a lot about different people you've been speaking with and different partnerships and all the way from you know nitty gritty science to directly on the field with farmers to extension agencies and national research institutes. How have you looked at your work in terms of these different partnerships? It's a huge topic uh, within, especially within in international development. So how, how have you been looking at those partnerships and engaging all of these different actors uh, towards this strategy? Well, it's, um, you know, from the beginning, it's been, uh, we, you know, we've been trying to bring together the agriculture and the nutrition communities. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we first tried to get the biofortification strategy uh, funded, the agricultural donors uh, said, uh, well, you know, the nutrition is, uh, is for the nutritionists to solve. It's not for us to solve. We're about, we're about high yields. <laughs> Uh, we're about reducing poverty, and we when we went to the nutrition donors, they said we don't we don't give money to agricultural research institutes. Um, that's not what we do. We we you know fund supplementation, we fund fortification, etc. So trying to uh, in the initial years, it was very difficult to get those two communities mm -hmm. to engage with one another, talk with one another. We had a we had a um, a conference that was actually sponsored by USAID at the International Rice Research Institute in 1999 and we had a hundred people and half of them were nutritionists and half of them mm -hmm. were plant scientists and almost all the nutritionists said this is the first time we've ever visited an agricultural research institute and they were kind of fascinated to to see all the experiments in the field and and everything mm -hmm. So of course it's more complicated than that. It's um, it's getting all the the stakeholders, the national government policymakers uh, involved. Uh, at our conference in Kigali a year ago, we had the Minister of Agriculture and the Minister of Health from Rwanda, the Minister of Agriculture and the Minister of Health from Nigeria, the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Health, and the Minister of Education from Uganda. They were they were all there and they were all advocating for biofortification. So it was really it was really been nice to bring those communities together. Of course, that's that's happening globally now. People recognize that that agriculture and nutrition are vitally linked, and agriculture is part of the solution. Definitely, really important, and definitely a great note to kind of start winding down. Um, from our incredible presentation with our awesome guests from uh, Harvest Plus, I'm going to ask uh, one more question that came from a variety of folks, which is, where do we get more information about this? Where do we go to learn more about biofortification efforts and this strategy that you've been talking about today through Harvest Plus? Well, the, uh, I guess you go, the, the main place to start would be our website, um, harvestplus.org. Um, and our, our contact information is there, and then we'll, we'll answer your emails and, and get you in touch with all the right people. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all of our participants for joining this webinar today. We look forward to continuing the discussion, and uh, please visit harvestplus.org. Did I get that right? Yeah. And also, please feel free to... Check out agrilinks.org in about two weeks. We'll definitely have all of these uh, resources posted, including the webinar itself. So you can share and get this information out to our huge, wonderful international development community. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.